Hello gamers and welcome back to another episode of Solo Spelunking where tonight I want to continue my Dagger Heart Open Better Playtest Quick Start Adventure. But before we start, uh, let me get a few things out of the way or let me make a few statements. So first of all, I would really like to thank you for your support because my video um, performed really well, my Dagger Heart video. And I did reach another milestone that I wanted to share with you. So as of today, I have accumulated 4,000 public watch hours. And this is another major milestone on my way to become a member of the YouTube Partnership Program. So I need 1,000 subscribers and I need 4,000 watch hours. And I do have the 4,000 watch hours, but I still need 200 somewhat subscribers. So if you're watching this and if you enjoyed the content and you like the channel and maybe you've taken a look at my other videos if you haven't subscribed yet and think, hmm, this is actually pretty interesting, please do subscribe because it costs you nothing, it makes me happy and it helps the channel. And um, yeah, whatever um, proceedings uh, I might eventually someday make from this channel will of course be put back into the channel, like purchasing game materials or better recording equipment or whatnot. So um, yeah, if you want to support the channel, please do subscribe. And before we start, I want to um, yeah, talk a little bit more about my first gaming experience, uh, about the feedback that I gave, because I thought about it and um, I do not want to do the game injustice. So one of the things I said is that I think it requires a lot of bookkeeping. So to be honest and fair, I think this game is not really targeted, of course, at a solo role-playing game audience. So um, if you play solo and you have to handle two characters and the GM duties, of course it is a lot of bookkeeping because you have to keep track of the fear tokens and you have to keep track of hope and stress of two player characters instead of one and this in addition to the GM duties. So I think you have to look at it at the perspective of a single player and uh, from the perspective of the main targeting group or main target group and I think this is not the solo role player audience so um, if like if I in retro retrospective think that I only have to keep track of my character that I play and the GM he keeps track of the fear and the other people keep track of their characters I think the bookkeeping will be significantly less and not such such a big factor in, in playing. So I think this is due to this nature of, of playing this game solo. So I just wanted to get this out of the way. But um, speaking of bookkeeping, I did decide to, to do something different now. So I made this little character lock for Marlo and on the other side it's for Rio. And here I just put down HP, stress, hope, armor. And here in parentheses, I put in the maximum value. So stress can have a maximum value of five, hope of three, uh, of five, armor of three. So here less is better. And here, uh, so I just, I will just note and erase, uh, no, note and cross out on this character lock so that I don't have to erase all the time on the character sheet because then uh, it'll make the character sheet look really messy and you always have these um, eraser crumbs everywhere. So this is not such a good idea. So I think if you have a lot of quick changing values like stress and hope, I think it is better to do it on some sort of, of scrap paper log. So I will do this here to keep the character sheet erasing to a minimum. All right. So these are some opening statements. And then again, because this seems to be something special because of an open better playtest, 
uh, I want to make sure that I follow my legal obligations and read this attribution statement uh, that I will do, uh, that I will read before I do a video using this playtest material and I will also put it in the description. So um, let me get this up here so that you can also see it. So this video was created using the Derrick and Press Community Gaming License. The Daggerheart Open Beta Materials are owned and copyrighted by Derrick and Press LLC. All rights are reserved. And this video is based on the following public game content created and owned by Derrick and Press. That's the Daggerheart Open Beta Materials. And Derrick and Press LLC 2024 available at daggerheart.com. And keep in mind, this is all Better rules, so everything you see here, game mechanic wise, is subject to change. All right, so now that we have this out of the way, and um, if any of you have a better understanding, if I need to read this attribution statement before every video, like I said, I read it in the FAQ on the Daggerheart page, and there they were talking about live streaming, but then live streaming, of course, is also recorded, and I think you can watch it later. So it's basically like a video, and there you have to, to put in this attribution statement or read it. So this is why I did this. Um, yeah, if any of you have a different understanding, please let me know. But I think I might rather not take a risk here. All right, so let's continue with our adventure. Our party of two. So this is my uh, human rogue Ryu, and this is Marlo Fairwind, the personal mage of the king. We are on an important mission to deliver a sealed chest. We don't know what's in it yet uh, to the village of Hush and uh, deliver it to the white arcanist for whatever reason. So reasons unknown to to Marlo and me. And we just survived an encounter and ambush by folk thieves that we disposed of. And this is a turned over merchant card blocking our path. This is our card and we had our horses tied to the underbrush here. And there are all these dead bodies now. So what we will do now is we will search them or at least Ryu, I will search them. I don't know what Marlo does um, uh, to see if they have any valuables, but also to see if maybe we can find some some interesting clues. Maybe this was a planned ambush, maybe not. Um, so we will figure this out. So first, um, let's roll on the Mythic Oracle. Uh, the mythic one page GM emulator oracle to see if we find anything unusual on the dead bodies and I'll give it a 50-50 chance. So do we find anything unusual, any hints um, that might suggest that that was a planned ambush or something on the bodies? It is 50-50. Eighty one. That's a no. All right. So nothing out of the ordinary. So it seems that this was just a random ambush, maybe. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think they have any valuables with them. So um, now we have to try to get this card here out of the way off the path. Uh, Whew, this card looks pretty pretty heavy. It's overturned. We should try to, to turn it over again so that it stands on its wheels so that we can drag it to the side. Are you with me here, Marlo? Yeah, all right, so we'll do it on three. So let's see if we can turn over this card. So um, it'll be a strength roll and sadly, we both have minus one, but because we do it together, I will give myself advantage on the roll. And advantage in Daggerheart is handled by an additional d6 that you roll and add. And if you have disadvantage, it'll be a d6 that you roll and subtract from your value. 
All right, so it is 2d12, and um, 2d12, those are called the duality dice, and the red one is the fear die. So 2d12, but we have advantage, so 1d6 that we can add, but it is a minus one to the road. We, we both have strength minus one. So Ryu, he'll make the roll and uh, Marlo will assist and this is why I gain the advantage. <clears throat> oh, and I need to decide on a difficulty, of course. So I don't want to make it too difficult. I'll set the difficulty at 11. So 10 is an easy difficulty and I'll set it at 11. So it's a minus one roll. A minus one road. Oh, all right. So now we do have a critical success. So whenever you roll doubles in Daggerheart, no matter what the number, it is a critical success. So you get what you want and uh, something extra. Uh, let me check here. I think you can like clear a stress or gain a hope or something. Um, let me check real quick. Critical success. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, here. All right, saving the best. I'll, I'll read it to you. Saving the best for last. If you ever roll two of the same number, no matter what the number is, that is a critical success in Daggerheart. You get what you wanted and a little extra. You get to mark a hope and you can also clear a stress if you have one. If it's an attack roll, it's not. You get to add the maximum your damage dice could roll as a modifier to your damage roll. All right, so um, I can gain a hope and clear a stress. So this is now where my character lock comes in handy. So I said that Ryu made the roll, so I can mark a hope. So my hope is four from a maximum of five, and I can clear a stress, but I'm at zero. So, um, and so together ugh, we push the card, we turn the card over. But I also said in my first video, since I'm playing solo, this is another mechanic that I will use to add twists and, and random events to the story whenever I roll double. So I did gain a critical success, but now I will roll on the mythic um, action description tables to generate some, some random twist that I will inject into the story. Let's see what we can come up with. 43 expectations. Interesting. 23 control expectations. And 45. Incomplete. It is incomplete and control expectations. Okay. So um, I have to keep my expectations in control because whatever is incomplete. So I got an idea. So this was a critical success. So we did manage to turn over the card. But as we turned over the card, we see that one of the wheels is cracked and broken. So um, the card is at an odd angle and we can't really push it off the road easily because... Uh, yeah, one wheel is broken, so somebody needs to 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 uh, get the lift it up. So and then we gotta push it. So this is somewhat difficult. So we have to we have to try again to to get it off the road. Okay. So ah, damn. This this wheel is broken. Damn. Okay. So we can't we can't really push it. So. I gotta, I gotta lift it up, and then we have to push it. Okay. All right. So, uh, Rio, he will uh, get in, in in the underbrush and 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 lift it up, while she tries to then push it somewhat like this so that we can can pass. All right. So that'll be another strength roll. 
and um, let's say, can I? Mm, yeah, so um, Marlo, she will spend a hope. You can spend a hope to use an experience or help an ally. And if you help an ally, it's like advantage. I think you add a d6 to the roll. Let me see again here. Mm. Uh, hope. Hope, hope, hope. Hmm. Um, you know, I don't want to spend too much time looking for the rules, so I will just say that, okay, she needs to spend a hope and then um, she'll help an ally, and that means... Um, I get to roll in another, an additional d6. So maybe this is also on the character sheet here someplace. Mm. No, but this is how I will play it. All right, so um, Marlo, she spends a hope. So she's at two, now she's at one, one hope. To help me, so I get another d6 to the roll, so it's again the duality dice plus 1d6. It's a difficulty of 11, and I get minus 1 because of my strength. <sighs> oh, no, oh, no, 8, 9, 10, 11, but I do get minus 1. Uh, because of my strength, so uh, 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 I try to to um, lift up the card, but it's harder to lift it up than to tilt it over. Um, so I can't, I can't lift it up. Uh, damn, it won't move. It won't budge. All right. So um, I think what we have to do now is. Damn, we can't, we can't get it off the road. Don't you have any any magic you can use? I mean, what good is it to be a mage if you don't have some sort of telekinetic spell in your disposal? But by the way, it was pretty impressive how you threw this this crystal folk thief against the tree there. Can't can't you do this with with this card? Can't you do like some sort of Arcane blast to to get this card of the road. You know what, Rio? Actually, that's not such a bad idea. I think it is worth a try. Let's see if we can, if I can, splinter this card maybe and um, and make it easier for us. All right. So this is a good idea. So she will. So. Uh, Stand clear. So what I will do now, <clears throat> I will replenish her tokens for the Unleash Chaos ability. So here it says um, you can mark a stress to replenish this card with tokens up to my spellcast trait. My spellcast trait is Instinct, which is two. So Marlo, she will mar I will mark a stress. So I'm at one now I'm at two of a maximum of five two stress and then I can put two tokens on this card again but um, I will not put these tokens on there because I will immediately use them um, and I will uh, deal 2d10 of magic damage and um, I will assign mm, all right, so let's let's just say this card. He it's got. Um, oh, and I didn't know if I rolled with fear or hope. Damn, I forgot to check, but never mind. So this card has twelve. Now the threshold doesn't matter. Now has twelve hit points, and I get to do two d ten of damage. And um, but first I need to see if I obviously hit. And then, um, yeah, I might blast this card into into oblivion. I think this is pretty cinematic. Okay, so um, 
First, I need to make a spellcast roll. But this will be easy because this card is big and not moving. So I will set the DC for the spellcast roll. I will set it at 8. So 10 is like easy. I will set it at 8. And I will roll my duality dice. Oh, um, I need this one because it's the fear die. Um, duality die. And uh, I got instinct of 2. So I put 2 tokens in there as a reminder. So I get plus two instinct is my spell casting ability. And I need to roll an eight or higher with 2d12. To, to do the maximum to unleash and, and, and channel the energy. It's, so I said eight. Yes, it's a critical success, 10-10. So again, a critical success, but this again means I have to interject some, some uh, event into the story, which I will do after I resolve this action. So um, let's roll damage. You know what? Since this is a critical success and this is basically like an attack, I, can, I do not need to roll damage because I would roll 2d10 and then I would add the maximum that could be rolled on 2d10, which is 20 again to the damage. So this is more than enough to to splinter this card into a thousand pieces so this is actually pretty cinematic all right so marlo hmm good thinking rio out of the box i knew i uh or i knew it was a good idea to take you with me <laughs> so watch this so she takes her staff she concentrates i can basically see how how she strains as she channels the arcane energies and then she puts the 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 staff her dual staff into the ground and shouts an arcane word of power and unleashes a wave of deadly arcane force which is like unchained elemental energy and i i don't really believe it but just like that, the entire card splinters into a thousand wooden pieces push, all over the place push, and clears the path, basically. Damn, Marlo, please uh, do remind me that I will never upset you. Whew, and she... Whew. Oh, and because it was a critical success, I can also mark a hope. So she's at hope two and clear a stress even. So the stress I got to re replenish my supply, uh, I could clear one. And this is actually pretty neat with this lock. So I don't need to erase anything. It is quick and clean. So that's a nice way to do it. So and the path is clear. Whew. All right. So let's let's continue. So we untie the horses. We get onto the carriage and we continue as I roll on the random event table to interject some yeah, some twist into the story. Action 13 as character. Okay, 13 character. 82 character official okay an official character okay so an official character i already got an idea but let's roll on the description table again 54 loud okay yeah loud official character okay this is interesting so we continue as suddenly um, we hear a loud, loud voices and shouting. No, not that way. This way. And get that tree over there. Hmm. All right. So we, we bring the carriage to a halt. And I, as Rio says to Marlo, hmm, seems like up ahead around the bend in the road there's something going on i might better check it out i scout ahead so um you'll wait here don't worry i won't be seen 
All right, you do that. So I'm a, um, a rogue and I got the hide ability. So if, when I move into a location where no enemies can see me, I'm hidden. So this is like an auto hide if I, then, if I do not move. And I also, I can step from shadow to shadow um, with a night walker. Um, let's see, you can move from shadow to shadow. When you step, is does it use any, yeah, marker stress to disappear, okay. But first I'll do it the conventional way. So I get off the cart and I sneak through the underbrush uh, to a point where I can see something and then um, yeah, I'll stop moving in the shadows and I hide and I become hidden. And I do see, uh, because what did I say, uh, a character and official, so I see a small detail of armored knights in plate armor wearing the coat of arms of the town and of the king marlow is the personal mage too i forgot the name wait a minute um of king uh, king uh, what is it called the king's name something with e um Damn. I think it is, it's here. Of King... King Emerus. Yeah, I knew it was something with E. All right. So those knights, they bear the coat of arms of King Emerus. So actually they seem like, like allies and they are trying or they are... They are cutting down some trees they're doing some some lumber work it is a detail of like six armed knights they have horses horses are tied to the trees and they're doing some woodwork for whatever reason okay hmm, interesting let's report back so i report back to marlo marlo it's a, a small detail, a squad of knights, six armored knights in plate armor, but they're bearing the coat of arms of King Emiris, just like uh, you have there on your breastplate, this little emblem. So they might be friendly or allies. They're doing some, some woodwork, it seems, some lumberjacking. So I'm pretty confused. Do you know something about this? You know what's going on? I don't know, maybe they're on some quest from the king to gather something, or maybe they're here to, I don't know, build a, an advantage point, a lookout, a hideout. I have no clue. All right, but we shouldn't have any trouble or problem getting past them. I mean, they're allies, right? Yeah, no, we shouldn't, actually. So let's just continue. All right, so we continue, and... Let's ask the oracle if those knights, they give us any trouble. But since um, they wear the coat of arms of the king and are probably our allies, I'll give it a very unlikely um, chance. It is a ver it's very unlikely that they do give us, or uh, do they give us any trouble is the question and it is very unlikely so do they give us any trouble yeah, it is very unlikely ah, i had i had a feeling it's 14 so that is a yes even though it is very unlikely they do give us trouble all right so Damn. All right, so this is interesting now. So um, as we approach them with our card, the man that appears to be the leader, um, he steps into the road with another one of his knights and he goes, halt. So we stop the carriage. Who are you and what is your business? All right, so um, Marlo looks down at him. 
there's got to be a joke, right? And she points at this small emblem, the coat of arms on her breastplate. You recognize this coat of arms, right? It's the same that you are wearing. Do you know who I am? I am Marlo Fairwind, the personal mage to King Emrier himself. So we do not have a problem. What is your problem, soldier? So she, um, yeah, she seems to be um, pretty annoyed about this interruption. So um, let's ask the Oregano, let's make a check if she can uh, or if she made an impression on him and um, I will roll presence and I will use my experience of royal mage because I'm I'm uh, using my position to 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 give some weight to my to my speech so I can cross off a hope to use an experience so I'm at hope one and I'm using my royal mage experience and my present score which is plus one and together with those plus two I get to add plus three so I will throw in three tokens and then I'll make the roll with my duality dice and I'll set the difficulty at 12. So it's not easy, but uh, so 10, 15, 20 is like the scale. So let's, I set it at 12. I got three in here. I spend a hope. Okay. So that is a nine and a 10. So I succeed with hope. And 10 plus three is 13. And I said, I think 12. Yeah. So I did barely make it and I get to um, gain, I gain a hope because I rolled with hope. So my hope is two. And so he looks at me and he looks at this coat of arms and then he goes, oh, yes, of course, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't recognize you at uh, just um, excuse the um, interruption. I just wanted to be thorough and they clear the road yeah but what exactly is it you're doing out here marlo asks and i i the surroundings at the situation cautiously ready for anything i never know this might be an ambush or something well i'm i'm terribly sorry mistress fairwind but as probably you are too, we're also on official military business uh, and on official duty. So if it's all the same to you in the interest of keeping our kingdom safe and secure, I better not disclose the nature of our mission out here. I think a woman in your position understands. Yeah, so um, actually she does because she also does not want to share exactly what it is we're up to. And because of her position as a personal mage, she knows better than to ask stupid questions and keeps, and it's a good thing to keep things on a need to know basis. So she thinks if she was supposed to know about it, she would. So um, it's all fine and we can continue on. All right, strange. Aren't you a little bit curious? Ryu asks her. You know, in my time at the court, um, I have learned to not ask too many questions and sometimes things are on a need to know basis for a reason. So I'm, I'm fine with it as long as they don't give us any more trouble and don't delay us further. I don't care. And if I really wanted to, I can ask the king after my return. Yeah, you're probably right. 
So, but it's getting pretty dark because um, it was already getting dark when we entered the sable wood part and we were delayed because of the ambush and had to move the cart. So I'll make a roll mm, if we think we can reach hush at a reasonable time during the night or before the night uh, or if it's better to to make camp but actually no we need to make haste so we we will press on no matter so um yeah but maybe the horses are tired let's let's roll and see if the horses if they can push on it's a 50 50. i'm using one page mythic and it's 50 50. so are the horses able to continue on 50 50. Seventeen, yes. So this is actually uh, pretty good. So yeah, the horses, because we were traveling at a leisurely pace, and also because of this interruptions where they got a, a short break, like when we had to clear the road, the horses are fine. So we can press on and continue. And yeah, after another hour or so, we arrive at the outskirts of the village of Hush. And I will read to you the scene of our arrival. Just one second. Arrival in Hush. Read the following aloud, I will. The path leads you further into the forest until you spot a large stone pillar, carved top to bottom in ancient dwarven symbols. This denotes one corner of the peaceful village of Hush. When you pass beyond the stone marker, you feel a small sensation like the pop of a bubble. Then the sounds of friendly chatter become louder. Through the trees of the sable wood are unchanged here. Nay, though, excuse me, though the trees of the sable wood are unchanged here, there is a distinctive, safe and comforting air. A few smiling faces turn to you as your carriage rolls in, waving or casting a warm greeting toward the party. There is lively music drifting your direction from the tavern at the center of town. You know you need to find the Whitefire Arcanist to deliver the package from the king. What would you like to do? Well, of course, <laughs> we want to travel uh, to the White Fire Arcanist, but we got to see where it's at. So, we are presently surprised. Hmm, this does indeed seem like a very pleasant place yeah it might be but um, we better be wary sadly i wasn't really told where this white fire arcanist lives i figured it can't be too hard to find him or her all right so why don't i stay with the carriage and why don't you take a look around? I think this is your kind of environment. Look, it seems like there's some sort of festivity uh, ongoing. And um, why don't you, you uh, check the tavern, talk to some people and see if someone can point us to the white fire arcanist. And I will stay here and, and guard the carriage and stay with the horses for the, for the moment. Yeah, all right, good idea. So, we will do that. Let's see um, if there's any any map that I could use. Yeah, 49 and 50. Mm -hmm. So, I head towards the, the village square and um, and try to talk to some people. And... There is a 
Oh, so while I'm I'm walking around, I I see something strange, and this is a humanoid robot called a clank. Um, I'll read the description to you. A soft-spoken clank, a humanoid robot of indeterminate age. He bears a number of small scratches across his metallic shoulder where an alert but friendly fox bed rests. He is playing an unknown game that uses cards and acorns, whatever that is. If the PCs approach, he's curious about the Thristle folk and ask if you encountered any on your way. So, um, yeah, I had towards the town squares, I spot this, this clank and I can't one uh, I can't help it but but stop for a while and look at him and wonder because I think I've never seen uh, such a creature and he notices it so um and and talks to me so his pronoun is he him even though he's a robot so he looks at me oh well hello there my name is Helleton Fives you must be one of the travelers that have just arrived from the Sablewood, am I not mistaken? Yeah, you are right. World travels fast in these parts. Yeah, we're a small community and we don't get a lot of visitors. So tell me, did you encounter anything interesting on your travels? Did you run into any trouble? You know, nothing worth noting, actually. Just the usual, some... Obstacles on the road, but nothing to be concerned about. Oh, is that so? Hmm. Well, that is good to hear. So what brings you to our wonderful community? Actually, maybe you can help me. Um, I am looking, or we are looking, for the Wildfire Arcanist. Do you know by any chance where I can find him? Oh, the white fire arcanist. Hmm. You should check in the tavern, the clover tavern up there. And he points to a large, huge tree standing next to the village square. And um, yeah, this, this tavern, um, I'll just read it to you. The Clover Tavern is a sight to behold, with six curving stories climbing the trunk of an ancient tree. This is the heart of the community, always crowded with music and good-natured conversation. Newcomers to the bar must take off their shoes and hang them over a line that stretch across the bar's ground floor. Inevitably, by the time visitors leave, their shoes will be shined and filled with small trinkets. So that's nice. As you enter, what would you like to do? So I'm not entering yet, so I just wanted to describe this tavern. So this is a huge tree, and it looks like it has six stories that are winding around this, this large tree. Oh, this is... I think I've never seen such a tavern before. Yes, the Clover Tavern is our proud and joy. You should go there, have a drink, and uh, look for Fidget. Fidget. They're a small, small human child, uh, always fiddling about. This is why they're called Fidget. And, um, yeah, so um, they can probably point you in the direction of the white fire arcanist because they know the fastest ways through the village and um, can help you and if you're wondering now why i'm actually indeed they do use pronouns here and fidget is a young child a human child but they use the pronoun they so that's what's in here so this is uh, what i will use okay so, um, yeah, so I'll report back to Marlowe. And did you learn anything? So she's still at the, at the carriage of the map. And uh, did you learn anything? Yes, actually I did. Uh, I was told to look for someone called Fidget, a small human child who supposedly knows 
the quickest way around the town and village and and who knows where to find or they know where to find the white fire arcanist see this big tree over there with the six stories basically built around its trunk this is the clover tavern like the the central community hub of this community here this is where we um, should look. I just saw that this is a little of the map, so uh, of the camera, sorry, so put it back into view. All right, so let's head over there. So we head over to the Clover Tavern, and um, indeed, as we enter, there seem to be some sort of festivities going on, and everybody has to take off their shoes and hang them on this line. And Marlo is like, let's let's see if she wants to take off her shoes or not, because I think she'd rather not because of her nature. Um, so I'll ask the oracle, does Marlo want to take off her shoes? I think it is unlikely. Does she want to take off her shoes? It's unlikely. Ninety. Of course, she does not want to take off her shoes. It is an exceptional no. So, um, yeah. So we enter, and I want to take off my shoes, or I'm about to take off my shoes, or rather boots. And she looks at me like, "What are you doing? Stop it!" But what do you mean, stop it? I mean, this is the local custom and tradition. We don't want to want to stick out and make a fuss now, do we? I'm not taking off my shoes and you're not as well. We're here on official business. We're not here to drink. We're not here to dance. We're not here to mingle with the local community. We got a quest to do. We have a mission to accomplish. We got someone to find. Damn, Marlo. Always business. No pleasure, is it? Well, in my position, I do not have much time for pleasure. Well, this is actually too bad. You should take the time to hang out with me more. I think we could have a nice time together. You know, you do what you want. I'll take my shoes off because I don't want to get into trouble here. <laughs> Fine, suit yourself then. But don't blame me if we get into a tight spot, a tight situation, and you're not fully combat ready because you can walk properly on hard or uneven ground or whatever yeah i mean come on this is a tavern i don't think um we will get any trouble here so we do enter the tavern but indeed since marlo uh, did not take off her shoes she's immediately approached by some personnel walking uh, working at the tavern and even though the personnel is friendly they're still determined mm. and um, um, excuse me, but I have to ask you to hang your shoes on the line. I have to insist. This is the local custom and we are firing the first moss we are celebrating. Excuse me. We are celebrating the first moss festival and... It would be very rude to not comply with our tradition. So please. Hmm. She, she growls. Well, then I'll wait outside. So she passes me. All right. So let's, let's find this child you're looking for. Ask the questions we need to ask. And then let's get on with it. I'll wait outside. She's like a little pissed and waits outside. Hmm, okay. So I ask around uh, and I am I am uh, pointed to Fidget. And uh, yeah, so... Um, hey you, you're Fidget, right? Can I buy you a drink? Non-alcoholic, of course. Oh yeah, I always uh, like a good drink. Non-alcoholic, of course. So who are you? Well, my name is Rio. I just got here. And um, somebody told me to, to seek you out. 
um, word is that you are the person to ask around here if you want to know something and that you know all the ins and outs of this community. That is right, I'm fidget and there's nothing that I do not know and nowhere where I cannot get to. <laughs> So I smile. So this reminds me a little bit of me in my youth as well. So nice to meet you, Fidget. I'm Rio. So let's let's sit down, have a drink and talk. So we sit down, we have a drink, we talk. So um, Fidget, are you able to point me into the direction of the Whitefire Arcanist? I got business uh, with him and I'll need to know where he lives. But the Whitefire Arcanist I think is is a she. Wait a minute. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's a she. Okay. Oh, you mean her? Yeah. I know where she lives. She lives in a tree house at the south edge of the village. You can't miss it. I'll lead you there. All right, thank you. So um, we finish our drink and then um, I turn to leave. And sure enough, as I want to um, put on my boots, they're filled with little shiny trinkets with some little crafted artwork and um, yeah oh this is a nice gesture so what what is the reason for that oh we are celebrating the first moss festival we are celebrating the um, upcoming harvest season and um, we are thankful for uh, the crops that will hopefully grow and everybody is overjoyed. So yeah, we we make small trinkets and we give them away to people and it's all pretty nice. <laughs> so I look through the trinkets uh, if there might be something nice that I can um that I can gift to Marlo, maybe like a a, a bracelet or something. <laughs> um so let's say it is likely do I find a nice bracelet that I can gift to Marlo? And it is likely because I'm a charmer and I want to show her that this community is actually pretty nice. It is likely 09, which is, I think, an exceptional yes. So I do find a beautifully crafted bracelet with crystal blue shimmering stones and finely uh, woven uh, a finely woven silk band so it's it's really nice looking it's very special so um so we head out um so she waits uh, down here at on the the village square so uh, i'll get down there and i have fidget with me and uh, so so she looks at me, and what did you get? Did you find out anything? And I'm like, well, what did I get? First, I got something for you. And I smile. What do you mean you got something for you? Look, here. And I'll hand her the bracelet with a charming smile. Perfectly fits your fine features. You should try it on. And she looks at it, and it is a very nice bracelet because it is. It, I was. A, I rolled an exceptional yes, and she's like, "Huh, hmm." So, so let me see. I want to like uh, work my charm on her. I will make a presence roll, and because I want to basically. Um, smooth her over I will use a hope so my hope goes down to three and I will use my experience charming to the last and my presence so I get plus four so I'll put four tokens already in my dice tray as a reminder 
and um, I have to make a duality dice roll, but it is not easy. Um, so the difficulty, let's see, it'll be, it'll be, let's see if, if I can roll against maybe an ability of her instinct is perceive, sense, navigate, charm, perform, deceive, control, I know this is motor control, oh, I think I also roll against her presence. So the difficulty is 15 plus her presence modifier, which is plus one. So I have to roll against a difficulty of 16. Mm, let's see, what is that? A difficulty of 16. Medium difficult? No, it's the, it's, you know what? She, she is, she's a hardliner. So it's between medium and hard. It's an 18. So I got to roll 2d12 plus four versus an 18. So this is not an easy task, uh, but um, so I do not want to lie to her. So I can't use my deaf deceiver. Um, so I'm just trying to smooth her over with my charming smile and my silver tongue and my good looks. And uh, yeah, it's an 18. 2d12 plus four. Okay, so actually, hmm, I would have to reroll that, but this is a, so this is sixteen plus four. That is a twenty, but with fear. So um, I earn one fear for um, for later. Put it on the fear tracker. So. Um, hmm. Yeah, let's let's make it cinematic. So she actually she looks at the bracelet and even though she she tries to to hide it, her features soften and 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 she smiles and she goes, "Well, this is pretty nice actually. Thank you. I I I haven't expected that. It, it it's been a long time um since somebody someone gave me something and, and, and talked to me like, like that. I mean, um, you know, if, if, if you're the personal mage, you, you do not get out much, but, but thank you. So it seems like as if she blushes slightly. So I, I smile and don't mention it. Just, just wear it and I think it, it suits you. But as we talk, because I, I wrote this fear a little foreboding, Hmm, the wind picks up somewhat and, and, and the clouds darken as if something draws near. Hmm. Is it me or, or was there a sudden weather change? Hmm. Well, let's, let's not waste any more time. Let's, let's head and find this white arcanist. And I've been told it's a she. Let's find her. Yeah, follow me. I'll lead you to her house. So we follow Fidget and they lead us to the white arcanist's house. And at this point, we will end this session. And we will finish the adventure with the final act tomorrow where I will do another video so that I can finish this quick playtest video this weekend. All right, so little, um, yeah, little, again, impressions. So this was a roleplay heavy session. And the, the quick start adventure actually, um, it actually encourages role playing and and tries to convey this this atmosphere and this uh, flavor and it also tries to always involve the players so um of course in a solo game you do it all yourself so but here like for example it asks the players uh, in the tavern to describe one of the tavern floors and and um, yeah, and involve the players in this creative world building process together. So um, 
It says here, let the players roleplay here for a bit, introduce them to a barkeep or a friendly local, let them explore the different levels of the tavern, and if you feel comfortable, ask some of your players to participate in describing details about it. And then it gives you some suggestions um, that the player made, or how you could encourage a player to, to describe something. So this this whole act three arrival in hush actually does focus a lot on on role playing and and those festivities so um yeah i think this is a nice change of pace and i'm pretty happy with just uh, crossing out and and noting hope and stress and fear on on this character log so i think this is a good way to handle it uh, so no erasing no mm, no um uh, handling of character sheets all the time so i think this is what i will do going forward and um yeah so i still do like the action resolution mechanic um one thing i thought about but i might even um fill out this survey that they have uh, on their dagger heart homepage where you can give feedback um, I don't really like it and i think i have this i heard this also in in some reviews that you use different task resolution mechanics in one system. So, for example, the players, they always roll their duality dice, 2d12, but the NPCs, when they attack, they roll 1d20. Um, so, I think I get it, because you don't want this hope and fear mechanic uh, on the GM side, because it's more like a player-facing side. And of course, the math, like bell curve versus, is, is easier. So um, I think either if you would implement the 2d12 mechanic for the NPCs as well, you might raise the evasion score slightly because the average rolls would be higher and lower and higher rolls would be, um, yeah, because of the bell curve, less frequent, especially lower rolls. So um so maybe you need to adjust that, so maybe it's not worth it, but the hope and fear mechanic I thought about you could still implement, but in a reverse way, like when the GM rolls and he rolls with fear, it is good for the GM, so he just gets a fear token, so you do not need to change anything in the system, so a fear, he gains a fear, but if the GM or the NPC rolls with hope, the player affected by the action, the target of the attack or action or whatever, would get a hope. So in this case it's reversed. If the DM rolls, hope would be bad for him because then the player he tries to affect would get a hope and fear would be good for him. He would just um, um, just get, get a fear. And in combat it wouldn't make a difference So because you do not change turns because the GM's move is set, so when the players roll with fear, he gets tokens that he can cash in, and for every token he can make a GM move. So, and if he has activated all his creatures during his move, that's it. So you wouldn't need this fear mechanic uh, when the GM is taking his turn, but you could still keep the same task resolution mechanic within one system. But then maybe you have to, to slightly adjust the math a little bit. Otherwise, the player's characters, they would get hit pretty often, I think. Because if you've got like an evasion of 9 and you roll 2d12 instead of a d20, plus 2 or 3, what the modifier is, I think this would be, um, or this would result in more hits than if you would just roll 1d20 because the chance of rolling low is actually less because of the bell curve. But... Um, yeah, maybe it's just not worth it. I just wanted to, to point this out. This was something that is odd, that you have this two dice type action resolution mechanic in one game. But yeah, so far I think it's interesting and I'm eager to continue. So, and I will continue and I will finish off this adventure um, tomorrow. So as always... Thank you for watching, thank you for your time and your support, and if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so, and as always, stay safe and stay healthy, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.